colleague who's Dr. Jim Birchfield. He is a professor of forest social sciences and also was formerly the dean of the College of Forestry, School of Forestry, College of Forestry here at University of Montana. Uh, I know him because he's part of the Western Montana Return Peace Corps volunteer group of which I'm a member and he formerly served as a Peace Corps volunteer in a small rural village in Guatemala. So I don't know if you're going to make any comments on Guatemala. I actually have some photographs from Guatemala. Yay. Okay. So we're so happy. And of course, he's done many things here at the University of Montana. He used to serve as the director of the Boley Center for People and Forests. He was formerly um, actually working with I think the U.S. Forest Service. I worked for the Forest Service a long for time. 20 years. Yeah, and also even in the International Office of the I U.S. Did. Forest Service. Right. So a wealth of experience both through academia but also through real life experience in forests. And so I'm just hoping that you can share with us some of your wisdom about development and forestry and conservation related things and also um, later on we'll try to leave some time for questions and answers. So if you have questions about Guatemala or Peace Corps or um, other interesting things, feel free to ask him. And I was going to ask you one more thing. Is it all right if as we go and there's something we don't an understand, can we raise our hands oh, and please. ask questions? Absolutely. Okay. So feel free to interrupt him then with questions. Are, the, are these lights good or do you want me to take them down a little bit further? <coughs> you know, I think it might be better if they're down a little bit. And you would you prefer? I can do either way, um, but some of the pictures are quite beautiful, and it might be hard to see if uh, if they're if the contrast isn't so good. That's nicer. What do you think? Yeah. Can you still write if you want to take notes or something like that? Okay. All right, great. Teresa, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight to talk about something that's been important to me my whole career, and that's environmental management. And I know that our title well, talked about biodiversity and the role of protected areas, and I'm going to touch on that. But considering the events of the last week, over the last week I decided to kind of move this lecture a little bit more into a sphere of economics and responsibility. And so perhaps at the end we can have a really heartfelt discussion about, wow, what's my role in this kind of changing world that's changed dramatically in the past week for all of us and will continue to change over the coming years because of these amazing global forces that are surrounding us. There are environmental forces like global climate change or loss of forests, and I'm really into forests and trees, so a lot of the lecture is going to be about that. Uh, that's also the house of most of the world's biodiversity, which was the topic of this lecture, so we're going to describe how forests' role in biodiversity is important. And what is biodiversity and why is that important? Well, it's the kind of web of life, if you will. It's all the genetics, it's all the life forms, it's all the organisms, it's all the species, it's us. It's all these things living on our body that we don't even know about. It's the reason that I really, really seriously doubt aliens will ever land on planet Earth, just because in more of the worlds they kind of got it right. This would be an extremely hostile environment for anyone to visit. Life is absolutely everywhere. But we're changing it. As a matter of fact, we're losing that diversity part of it, the system that has all the kinds of differences and ability to mutate and evolve. We're kind of crashing down our bank account real fast, a lot of it because we're losing our tropical forests, and I'll talk about that, and a lot of it because we as humans are just so powerful. We can change things. We build these buildings with rooms that are heated with fossil fuel energy and we pave everything and we move all over the place and we you know, have our will exerted, whether it's damming rivers or changing the, the, uh, the, the landscape into farms or whether it's uh, you know, doing something in our backyard, uh, killing our weeds. We are amazingly powerful. And this is it, okay? I mean, we learn a lot about our environment as we progress and in the last, in my lifetime, in the last 65 years, we have learned so much about the planets. Now we know there's lots of them. There's billions of planets, maybe 
lots of these Goldilocks planets. You know what I'm talking about with a Goldilocks planet? Not too hot, not too cold, just right. You know, rocky little orbs out there revolving a star. And, you know, the probability that there is no other life in the universe, scientists now think is pretty low. You know, if there's billions of these things, maybe there's, there's more of us. And scientists like E.O. Wilson even think, if there is intelligent life, it's kind of probable that there'll be bipeds. And not too big, they'll be kind of perhaps like us. This is, we've evolved into a pretty handsome little structure here that we can carry this big brain around and do all kinds of things and interact and reproduce, not too fast. Uh, there's a reason that we're the way that we are. So maybe there's lots more of us. But the problem with that is between here and the next place that has anything, and we'd be freaking out with happiness if by Alpha Centauri we found, we've already found this little rocky planet, it's about 10 light years away. 10 light years away <laughs> is too far, okay? <laughs> it's like really, really too far. It'd be like trying to crawl from here to Moscow if you were the size of, you know, uh, an atom. It's just way, way too far. We're not going to get there. Physics, even though warp speed and all these <laughs> cool things in science fiction make us think, oh man, we could get there. You know, you talk to the physicist, it's like, uh, maybe, maybe in 50, 100, thousand years, we'll have to figure out a way to beam ourselves somewhere, but it's pretty unlikely. The, the laws of physics are kind of against us. So, for all practical purposes, and for our lifetimes, certainly, this is it. This is all we got. And I just looked on the global population counter, and you can go on your computer, and the numbers keep going up, 7.48 uh, billion. So, 7 billion 484 million people right now, and by tomorrow morning, that'll be 485 million people, and there's a lot of us. And we, and here we are, these powerful organisms, evolved to be on this planet, we're, we're part of it, and we have a lot of demands. We want to use it. And we organize our demands around what we call an economy. You know, the word economy is Greek for the house. This is our house, so this is how we deal with it. And how we deal with it is sometimes unbelievably beautiful. We make symphonies, and we have love, and we have friends, and we eat wonderfully interesting food that tastes delicious, and we do all these cool things. And then we do some things that are not so great. Um, some of those things are actually fairly harmful to the other life organisms around us. Uh, we even have this frighteningly almost supernatural power to split the atom and make it, you know, go through this incredible combustion that we know as nuclear bombs. And these are really, really scary. Things that can make life on Earth as we know it end in a matter of days. That's really bad. We have to make sure we don't make any mistakes with these weapons. Um, and so far in my lifetime, we haven't. So let's keep a lid on that. Don't want to be depressing here because at the end of this lecture and our discussion, what I want to be able to do is talk about what our role is. We're so amazingly powerful and human beings can create things that we don't even think about yet. In your lifetime, you're going to run into stuff that's just so great and, and outstanding in terms of making life better that I can't even imagine. I mean, I can read science fiction and it's going to be more amazing than that. So you have a chance, you have agency, you have this ability to make change based on your own will, based on your own volition. So having said that, knowing that you have this amazing human personal power, um, it'll be fun at the end of the lecture to think about after you see me talk about these interactions, um, wow, what can I do? What kinds of things can I do to make the world better, to make myself happier? to make other people happier, to make all those beautiful things that I talked about, music and love and friends, all those things more accessible to all of us. Because we can. We really can do great things. When I think about even my parents' lives, they weren't even close to as comfortable as my life. They didn't have the kind of medical care 
I mean, I was one of the very first kids to get a polio vaccine. You know, that was a debilitating disease for my parents' generation. Um, and now you have the ability to completely wipe out things like smallpox that annihilated most of the American Indian population in North America uh, in a matter of 100 years and between 1500 and 1600. And that's, it's almost gone completely. It's amazing what we've done. So we have agency, we can do things, and we're going to talk about that at the end. So here's a little outline of what I hope to talk about in the next uh, 45 minutes. Is that about right? Is that too long for me to talk? Then we'll have about 20 minutes for questions. Hey, and you know what? Ask some questions as I go along because my slides are kind of just me and I get tedious after a while. And if we go out on a little branch <laughs> of an idea that you have, that'd be more fun for all of us. Um, so please, just, just pipe right up. Okay, here's what I'm going to talk about. Really, how we deal with the world is an ethical framework. And, I've, and I'm talking about global free riders, environmental services and the common good. Environmental services are all those things that we kind of take for granted. That's why I call us free riders. We're just on this planet riding around. Things are great. Oxygen, da-da, did we produce that oxygen? No, 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 not really. It's really the product of plants and when they photosynthesize and they keep doing it. Hooray, I'm so glad it's here. You know, three billion years ago, there wasn't any oxygen. It was all methane. We'd die instantly. But we, life has created oxygen for us. So we're riding along breathing. We have nutrient cycling that we don't do anything about. It just ha kind of happens. And then my carrot grows. And it's like, great, I just planted this seed and all this chemical processes are going on under the ground. I'm not paying any attention to it. And voila, I have a carrot. This and this great. But basically, we're not paying for that. We're only, we're only paying for a little tiny shred of what the world is providing us. And we're thinking about this idea of equity up here. This idea of not only equity for us all who are here now, but for those of us who haven't been born yet. And we hope there's going to be more of us in the future. Hopefully not too many more than 7.484 billion, but uh, you know, at some point enough so that the life on Earth that is human life can be sustained and, and live in a way that's joyful and peaceful and fun and the things that we all like. But those environmental services I'm going to go over in detail um, and, and we, it's things that you don't really think about too much, like pollination. You really think much about pollination. You're kind of, boy, I'm sure glad we got that pollinator out there. Woo, that bat. Mm, really glad for that. You, we don't. But without that, there's no food. I mean, we're deep trouble. So a lot of these things are going on and we're not paying attention. I'm really into trees. I just love them. I hug them. I walk in them. When I was feeling sad on last Wednesday, I went in the forest for about three hours. It really helped. So I recommend it. Going into the forest is always kind of a, if, at least for me and maybe for you, uh, a place where I feel uh, centered. And biodiversity is so linked to these big plants that we call trees that uh, I'm, I'm going to pay some attention to that. And then I'm going to get into a little bit of a gray area for us and talk about property, something that most of us don't know very much about. Um, and it's how we organize our economy via ownership, which is a relatively modern idea. Um, but the idea of property has been around pretty much forever. But the fact that we think we, we have dominion over it is relatively new. American Indians had a very different view of the world around them and who, who it belonged to, who owned it. We have kind of changed that, but we don't reflect on that very much, and I want to allow you to reflect on that a little bit. And then, of course, I'm on a nice big finish, hope and hard times. This is a tough period for all of us. We want to think about what we can do that's positive to make this world a better place because we can. We have enormous power. So if there's one thing I want you to remember when you walk out of this room, it's that I have power. I am somebody. I can make a difference. I am not a victim. I am not going to be manipulated. I can change the world around me by my own thoughts and actions. So that's all I want you to do. The rest of the time you can kind of enjoy this, look at these cool pictures, and walk out of here and think, 
I'm going to do it. All right. Now, I'm making one primary assumption, and I feel pretty comfortable about this, that all these things that we like, the human well-being, the joy, the happiness, love, depend on healthy ecological systems. If we mess up that blue ball too much, we, are, we have lots of strife. It's, it's tough. If there's not any food, if there's not any energy, if you're cold, if things are going badly, um, suddenly these wonderful things become way too hard. And uh, the other thing I, I just want to touch on extremely <coughs> briefly that wasn't in that summary was, we got here because there is a, such a thing as history. It's not an accident that we're here. There's a lot of stuff that happened before us. And knowing about that and being aware of it, not becoming obsessed with it, but being aware of it, helps us to move forward. Because we kind of understand our behavior today and in the future if we understand how we did things in the past. I wanted to show a photograph of one of the most egregious groups of people I have encountered. Uh, and I've only encountered their descendants. These are the leaders of the United Fruit Company in 1920 in Guatemala, who were perhaps some of the most oppressive people I can imagine. They took poor Mayan Indians' land, they converted them into banana plantations, and that in itself was not so bad. But because they wanted to keep those banana plantations and keep the population poor, they embarked on a worldwide system of exploitation and violence that precipitated all the way through the U.S. <laughs> government to the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles, whose brother was the lead attorney for the United Fruit Company, and did all kinds of terrible things to poor people throughout the Americas. So people can behave badly, and we don't want to behave badly. We can learn from that. Hmm, we don't want to go and create this awful shibboleth of a banana republic, a dependent place that is, that is sucked up by the wealth and power of a, a, a foreign business or agent that's controlling their lives through violence. And that is the story, by the way, of Guatemala, a place I lived. She discussed, you know, I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and I wandered into Guatemala thinking, hmm, 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 things are going to be kind of like the U.S. There's a justice system, you know, there's a police department that works, uh, there's schools that have books, uh, there's hospitals that are good, and <laughs> there was none of that. There was none of that, even though a lot of wealth in that country, tremendous agricultural land, you know, billions in banana production and other things, and none of it went to the people. So that is some of the ways that we mess up, and we don't want to do that anymore. Even though the temptation is often there, that's the past, okay? We learn from this, this is not how we want to behave in the future. And the, thankfully, we have learned from that. Now we have international trade agreements. Now we have a lot of things to mitigate this kind of bad behavior from the past. But we still struggle with the fact that we don't pay for very much of the most important stuff. Uh, and so this is this idea of a free rider. Free rider is someone who consumes a resource without paying for it. And we do a lot of that. And it doesn't seem fair, does it? That, you know, you're getting a benefit for something that is at no cost. It wouldn't be fair for me to live in this nice house and uh, not pay my heating bill or not pay any taxes. And my poor neighbor uh, is working away and got to pay the taxes and the heating bill and uh, insurance and everything else, and I don't have to do anything. You know, we have this sense of equity. We have this sense of fairness. And so at some point, to be able to manage the world, we need to remember that in our history we weren't treating people very fairly and that we can do better. But we also have to acknowledge we're all part of this. We're all free riders in some way. As I mentioned, we're breathing and doing those things. It's part of life on Earth. But a lot of these critical functions are taken for granted and we have to stop doing that because if we do, we won't behave the same way. We won't plow up very fertile ground and put new pizza huts. Uh, we won't tear up forests and allow watersheds to be destroyed and not pay for it. Soil 
by the way, is one of our most important resources. Another thing we don't think of very much. I mentioned my carrots a little bit ago. But it's alive. There's like, in, in a little gram of soil, there's like, you know, 200 million organisms. It's like, whoa, I had no idea that this stuff is so imbued with life and it's doing all these things. And yet, we're not addressing it. No one seems to care if you tear up the agricultural land and put in a pizza hut. But boy, that's a long-term cost to be able to address, where are we going to get that production again? So back in the earlier part of the 20th century, we kind of came up with this idea called sustainability. All right, OK, we don't want to mess up the future. We made a lot of mistakes in the past. We were like those big fat cats sitting in that train in Guatemala. Ho, 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 we can do whatever we want. Um, and that's maybe not so good, because we want our children and our children's children and others to really deal with the world in a more just way. Uh, and to have what they need. If they have no soil, if they don't have any oxygen, they don't have any wood, they don't have any wildlife, they don't have any of these other things that we just take for granted, life isn't going to be very pleasant for anybody. So, in 1987, this group of world leaders, led by a Norwegian woman, Gro Brundtland, she was the prime minister there, a really wonderful person, developed this statement on what is our planetary goal towards the environment. And this is environment and development. Not just let's save everything in a wilderness area or national park, but how is it across the world that some poor Guatemalan, for example, and I'll keep going back there because I know this country, um, can actually meet their needs and, and have a fulfilling life, but not use everything up like those United Fruit Company guys did. So the goal is this, development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So that means here I am, the old fart, with a class a few years ago, and here's all these, you know, young first year students. And I have to make sure that I don't gobble up everything and leave everyone younger than me, including you in this room, uh, was not enough. That's just to me, a moral issue and something that is not a behavior that is fair, that is some part of my own ideology of what's right and wrong. My value is, is that equity, this fairness idea, is important. I should pay taxes and insurance costs just like my neighbor does. And so, therefore, I should behave in a way that future generations like you and your children and children's children will have this beautiful blue planet with functioning soil and carrots and all these other things that make life fun. And so what are these things? What are some of these ecosystem services that we don't pay much attention to? And I've listed them here. Some of them, there's not all of them, obviously. There's probably, you know, two dozen, three dozen more. But these are kind of the big ones that we really have to pay attention to because we've kind of been messing them up a lot, uh, especially with all this amazing power we have now with our technology and big giant machines, uh, you know, our capability to, to make massive changes. So the first one, of course, the biggest challenge we as humanity might face is climate regulation. Holy mackerel, we have messed up the whole atmosphere. That's, that's pretty big. We saw that planet there. I mean, it's kind of a thin skin around the planet, but still there's a lot of it. And we have pumped so much carbon and so much methane and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere that we have changed the climate. You know, that's kind of hard to believe. Now, clearly, things like giant volcanoes and other natural events change the climate too. That's a level of power that's beyond all the nuclear weapons we have combined <coughs> blowing up in Mount Mazama. You guys should go to Crater Lake someday, by the way. If you haven't been there, uh, anybody been to Crater Lake? Raise your hand. Crater Lake. There you go. If you go there, there's like a little interpretive <coughs> sign that talks about, well, here's this lake, and you, know, you see it's really beautiful. If you're in the color blue, you should just go, because it's the best blue ever. Um, the mountain was like five times bigger than the hole in the ground, which is massive beyond our comprehension, and it totally blew up and <coughs> put the world into this, you know, ice age. Uh, Wow, there's a lot of power in the world. So it's taken us a lot of work to mess up the climate. And we gotta, we gotta think about that because it changes a lot. It changes a lot right here where we live in Montana. We're gonna have smoke pretty much every August for as long as you guys are here because we're gonna have a lot of wildfires because it's a lot hotter and a lot drier in the summers. Water regulation and supply. I'm gonna go into this a little bit later. 
man, if there's one thing other than the climate that we've got to take care of, it's the water. There is no substitute, okay? If we don't have water as humans, we move. Um, there's a cool book, uh, Water and the Struggle for Civilization. And it it's, a, it's a world history that's oriented around our ability to use water and to irrigate. And if you fail, you die. And we go through all these failed societies. The Mayans, by the way, who are still in Guatemala, had this high culture about 800 AD, cities, all this stuff. They mismanaged the water, collapsed into horrific warfare. Most of them died. Uh, we go into the Anasazi ruins in Mesa Verde in southwest U.S. They messed up their water, poof, gone. All over the planet, you screw up the water, it's over. There's no substitute. It is, you know, perhaps the closest thing that is the analog for a life force that there is on the planet. So water, big deal. And here's what happens in the ecosystems. It affects the hydrological flows. Of course, gravity affects that, how it moves through the system, where it is. We put a road in a forest, for example, that changes how the water moves. It boom, you know, bumps into it instead of going percolating down. It kind of follows the road, rips up a lot of the soil, you know, messes up fish habitat. Ooh, we didn't know that. Gee, we never paid attention to the, well, the hydrologic flow. We didn't pay for that with the road. Um, the storage, where's the water stored? Stored in soil, plants, all these other places. Uh, its ability to be retained. All these things are happening out there and we're kind of not conscious of them. In modernity, we've learned that, ooh, these things are all interacting. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just read them quickly. Soil formation, I've already talked about soil. Genetic resources, <laughs> this is kind of the holy grail. This is, this is what makes life reproduce. And over time, genes do change, they mutate. That's why we're here, that's why we're humans. If there was no mutation, there wouldn't be any human beings. We'd all be microorganisms or something. But it has happened, and that's where we see the diversity of life. We want to preserve those. That's why we have different kinds of food, we have different genes, we have different kinds of animals. Um, and this is the idea of biodiversity, protecting those genetic resources. Because once they're gone, <laughs> We don't know how to rebuild them. We think we do, but we don't have the original material. We always start out with the original material. Nutrient cycling, I already mentioned that, how carbon and nitrogen, phosphorus, all these vital things that keep us alive are moving through our ecosystem. And then some of the other things that probably are less significant than those top five, how we treat waste, pollination I mentioned, how much raw material we have. You know, there's only so much of the elements. There's only so much copper. There's only so much nickel. There's only, st you know, we got to go off in the stars to make any new gold in some supernova that crushes these atoms together. Just happened to be here when the dust congealed. Uh, we're not getting any new gold, okay? There's just only that much. And we're not getting any new uh, of these other elements. We're not getting new iron. We're not getting any new zinc. <laughs> we, need, we need all of those. If we had no zinc, we'd be dead. All, all the things that we just kind of, hmm? Oh, there's plenty of that. Well, actually, there's that ball, and there's only so much of little stuff around there. And, there, and there's even micro kinds of elements that, ooh, we gotta really be careful with those. Sometimes they're called strategic elements, you know. I'll go too far. Uh, regulating disturbances, wildlife habitats, recreation, cultural sustenance, you know, geez, life is fun. Uh, why can't we? recognize that the environment's providing these things and allow us to, you know, pay for that stuff. Because it can be great. This isn't my photograph. Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah. You can't take a picture that good. Um, so, and here's how we've organized our economy. We, we think about all these things that are natural capital, all the ecosystem services, solar energy is going, the soil's growing, the plant evolution and genetic resources. You know, this is, this is most of the economy here. We pay nothing for this, nothing. We only pay for this. You know, how much does it take to rip all that iron out of the ground and the other rare minerals that go into that car? Ta-da! That's all we pay for. And we're missing most of the rest. So the earth is getting cheated. The earth is my, the neighbor. Who was like, man, I'm paying for everything, and you, you're over here, Jim, driving this car, 
You know, pay for squat. What, how fair is that? And it's not. That's the challenge of the future generations is to figure out how do we make sure that we value this enough that we don't waste it, that we don't think it's just totally available, because it isn't. And then we have to dispose, of course, and this gives us, this gives us a lot of hope. This is, there's a lot of potential here. Man, we are going to be mining our landfills forever. There, we've thrown away so much stuff that's so valuable that we're going to go, whoa, I, I better go find that zinc in that battery. <laughs> and because there's only so much, it'll be cheaper to do that than it will be to go and find new because there's only so much in the Earth's crust. So, a lot of potential on that end. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to talk just very briefly about trade, that we exchange this stuff. We don't pay for most of it, but the stuff in the market economy, we move all over the place. Like those guys in the, in the uh, United Fruit Company, they're selling the bananas. They're from a company from Boston. They're selling the bananas all over the world. People love bananas. Bananas are great, by the way. <laughs> you, you, I don't know if you guys remember, but in 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell down, the East Berliners finally had a chance to get out, go to West Berlin and get things in the West. One of the very first things that were just completely gone from the marketplace were bananas. They just totally <laughs> went crazy. And I love bananas too. <laughs> so, but they're, they're all, all over the world because they're even produced in a few places. We're able to move them. We're able to ship things. These are wood chips from old growth cedar and Douglas fir on Vancouver Island. This is Port Alberni, Canada and British Columbia uh, being shipped to Korea. They're going to make flake board. And then whoop, ship it back over here. So the world economy is unbelievably interconnected. And I, and I gotta say, in, in the last political season, when all this talk about, oh, free trade is so terrible, blah, blah, we have had trade basically forever. American Indians traded. It's what we do. We are going to exchange. But we remember we have one planet, so we have to figure out how do we trade in a way that is actually fair because all of us depend on this. And unfortunately, this was my neighbor in Guatemala. This is Juan, my, uh, he, he lived next door. And I, you know, being a rich gringo there, I made $135 a month. I lived there in the 1970s. And man, was I was like, that's the richest I have ever been. I mean, you know, what is that? You know, 1,500 a year, something like that? Imagine living here in Missoula on 1,500. Maybe you guys do, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> But I was loaded with money. And this guy's family probably made $2 a day, maybe, if they were lucky, if things were going well. Um, and I didn't need this grass in my backyard. And to make a little extra dough, they would, they would board horses in his house for the market day for, on Sundays, when people would come with their horses, get all their food at one time, and then go back out to the satellite villages where they lived. <coughs> and the fact that I had grass to feed the horses was kind of made his little stable, the little place to keep the horses, the premium stable in town. So he could charge them a nickel or something for their horse and uh, while they went to the market. But so I let him come into my backyard and you know, use a machete and cut my grass. He loved it. I guess what I'm trying to say with this slide is, is that we live in this society that because of trade, that because of production, and because of ownership and property, which I'm going to get to in a little bit, there are the haves and the have-nots. This is real. This is real in our country. We, we have a very kind of gra graded system where in the United States we're fortunate to have a very large middle class and a lot of comfort. People like us live very well compared to the middle classes or classes throughout the world. But the exploitation of resources has had a profound impact on a lot of humanity who is very poor. And they don't have the same set of incentives to be able to protect nature and deal with environmental services and pay for more because they're just trying to get enough food to be able to survive. So the situation is complicated by our history. It's not as if we can expect everyone to start paying for these environmental services in the same way. It may be that countries like the United States and Sweden and other places with wealth are going to have to show leadership in charging ourselves for the environmental services on which we all depend. And that's how we can possibly protect biodiversity. Because these people are working hard. 
This, is, this guy would make like, you know, a dollar a day hauling uh, cotton in Guatemala. And if they rebelled or did anything awful, I did not take this photograph either. This was taken by a French photographer after I left. Um, there's repression, you know. We spend a ton of money ensuring that that kind of bifurcation of wealth and power, with the wealth and power being in a few hands and poverty in a place like this being in the hands of many, is sustained. And it's sustained through force, which is, in my view, wrong. I'm very judgmental, okay? You have to kind of get over that fact that I am operating from a moral position. And I'm talking about the morality of protecting nature, I'm talking about the morality of us being able to behave well. And I'm talking about the morality of nonviolence. I don't think that violence is the answer. So those are, those are judgments that I've made. And you, you, you're very welcome to challenge those issues um, because I've just experienced them and believe in them. And you have make judgments and have values. And by the way, it's okay. It's important to sustain values and to believe in them and to think through them. You, you can change your values. Um, but not having them, being amoral, being a nihilist or something, you know, go read, go read Turgenev or Dostoevsky or any of those Russian guys of the 19th century and they explore what that means to, to not care about anything. And it's, and it's a bleak, bleak existence. So I'm not recommending that, but I'm recommending that you do embrace values and you're open about them and I hope I'm open enough about mine that you understand that, you know, this point of view is something that I own, you don't have to. You can disbelieve what, whatever it is that I say, but what I want you to communicate to you is embrace your own values. It gives you power. It allows you to act. It allows you to act feeling like you have the authority to act because you're reflected on what's important to you. Now, what's important to me, I love forests. And this is a photograph from Ecuador. I worked there for a little while. Um, where all the trees are gone. This was a forested area. This is in the Andes. And all the trees were harvested. Goats and sheep grazed it for a couple hundred years. And the vegetation is gone. This is not good. This is not good for environmental services. This is not good for biodiversity. We can mess, this is extreme mess up, okay? We, we know we don't want to do this. By the way, there's been heroic efforts to recover this land. This picture was taken in the early 80s, and there's a lot of trees there now, which is really great. We also have to be able to understand what our tools are. If we're going to do something, if we have this kind of moral compass, that this is what we believe is good, how we should move forward, um, science is a great tool. You've seen this before. I won't belabor it. You've had someone, I imagine, come and talk about global climate change in this class already. Well, this is the famous hockey stick drawing of here's, you know, temperatures, here's time, here's all this time, 1,000, up to 1,800, 1,900, 2,000, uh, 2,100, you know, and another, and another 80 uh, years or so, uh, 83 years. Uh, <laughs> global temperatures are going to go through the roof. This is really, really, really bad news. This is extreme bad news for someone in Vanuatu who won't even have a country anymore because the oceans will cover it up. But this is really bad news for the people in South Florida who won't be able to live there anymore because it'll be totally underwater as well. But it's extremely bad news for, that, for my friend Juan in Guatemala because the poor are the ones who are going to get hurt. The people who are going to get hurt by global warming are those who are right on the edge of survival right now because food production is going to drop. We're going to have dramatic shifts in our ability to uh, adapt to this, this amazing sets of storm events, flooding, um, drought, and other things that will make common economic relations and trade very, very hard. And one of the biggest things that's going to be affected by global warming is the availability of clean water. Hey, you guys can go to a cool website. <clears throat> and I did this just about a year ago because I was standing on the shore of Lake Michigan. I'm originally from Michigan. And I'm looking out to Lake Michigan. You know, it's just an amazing Great Lake. I don't know if you guys, anybody from the Great Lakes or from around the Great Lakes? You've been there. These are, you know, 20% of the world's water is in five lakes <laughs> surrounding, you know, a few uh, states in North America. 20%. That's a lot. 
And so you're looking at this lake and thinking, I wonder how much water there is in the world. So you can go on the NOAA website. You can just type into Google, how much water is in the world? You'll get very quickly to the NOAA website and it's going to draw something. I'll do it. Um, I hope I get through my slides. You know, I haven't lectured in a little while. I'm really getting carried away. So uh, when, when we get to talk, I'm going to stop no matter what, Teresa, at, at, uh, at 8 o'clock. But you go to this NOAA website and here's the Earth. And it dries up all the oceans and shows you how much water there is. And so here's the, here's the, you know, the U.S., here's, you know, North America and South America. So how much water is in the world? And it turns it into a sphere. So draining all the oceans, all the underground water, everything, the sphere of water is like this big, you know. Here's the sphere of water. That's it. That's all the water. It's salt water, too. How much fresh water? And then you get a little sphere about like this. How much available fresh water? Because most of the fresh water is an ice. Little thing over Atlanta. That's it. That's the available fresh water. If it was a sphere. That's it. That's not very friggin' much. Why? Because these oceans aren't very deep. This is 8,000 miles. There's no ocean that's even one mile deep. Most of it's way less than a mile deep. There isn't that much water. This is all rock. And the skin of water, and the skin of atmosphere, that'll, that'll put the fear of, whoa, we better be doing something better with our water. Maybe I won't be irrigating so much my green grass in my lawn. <clears throat> okay. Wow, are we lucky here in Montana. Top of the watershed, beautiful clean water. Taking care of it is our business. Now, being able to irrigate is what has made civilization. It's what's given us food, you know, it's important. But wow, a lot of times we don't use effective irrigation conservation measures and we can do way, way better. And of course, the oceans are this untapped reservoir of water that we're probably going to have to figure out how to use because there's not a whole lot of fresh water available to us. Okay, now I'm going to talk about forest and biodiversity for about 10 minutes. Um, most of the world's biodiversity are in the tropical forests, not in the temperate forests. The good news about the temperate forests, the forests that are right outside here, this is, I took this picture in Patty Canyon, really beautiful ponderosa pine. Um, this is a picture from Guatemala again, down in the, the cell of the jungle, uh, the humid tropical forest uh, near the Peten. Uh, look at the chain, look at how much plant life there is there. It's amazing. That's where all this life is. Of course, the Lorax, unless, okay, I had to throw that in. So, here's what's going on in the world's forest. Now, these are in uh, hectares, which is how most of the world thinks about land area. We think in acres. So, the conversion is about 2.45 acres per hectare. A hectare is, in other words, two and a half times bigger than an acre. Um, someday, we're going to wake up and smell the coffee here and go to uh, metric units in the U.S., but that's not happening soon. So the net change, about 9 million hectares a year of forest cover globally is being lost every year. Um, the net change in the natural forest is quite a bit larger. Now remember, we have a lot of artificial forests. We plant trees. We create new forests. But what's most interesting is the tropical countries are losing a ton but the non-tropical countries like us, we're gaining forest land. We have more forest land now than we did 100 years ago, by a lot. And that's really impressive. Why? A lot of farmland converted in the Midwest back to forest again. A lot of people have abandoned, you know, the family farms. My grandmother, uh, you know, was born on a little farm in Ohio. You know, she moved to the city because her dad, the Depression, they had to get a job working in a steel mill. And then the steel mill closed. But the farm was never repopulated again. Eventually, they sold, my mom, you know, when I was about 12, sold the land to the Forest Service. And now it's the Wayne National part of their, my, you know, family's farm, part of the Forest Service. And it grows trees. I visited it as a forester. It was, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It's kind of heartbreaking because it was such a pretty piece <coughs> of land. Uh, but I was kind of happy about that. Wow, it turned into forest. So, we're, we're, but we're still, we're still losing a lot. And these are the forests that are where all the life is. This is where, whoa, we better do something. Well, 
I'll show you what's going on. This is what's going on. Some people are poor and need the money, and they're going to try to make money from the forest. Others are big logging concessions who are just trying to make profit. So they're cutting down a diptocarp here in Indonesia. Now, before we start thinking that, oh, those, those people overseas, man, they, they are messed up. How could they do? We never would do that here in the United States. This is, this is me, you know, 30 years ago. Then uh, these are redwoods, and I'm a forester. Now, I did, not, I did not lay out that timber sale, okay? I, that was not my fault. But I laid out some timber sales with trees just about that big. And I'm not feeling so great about that now. Um, yeah, there's not that much old growth left. But we still are doing it. We did it here big time. We did it here, it, it, an amazing amount of forest conversion happened here in the United States. Now things are coming back. But not that long ago, when I was alive, and uh, you know, I thought I was a cool guy, uh, you know, we were, we were making a lot of mistakes. And here's, you know, this is me. I took this picture. This is my, he worked for, this is Paige Dilks. He worked for me. We're cutting down big Pacific silver fir and, and uh, outside of Seattle. Yeah, baby. Look, look, look what we did. Oh, my God. We built houses. We built Tokyo. Built Shanghai. Built cities all over the world with that wood. That wood, just like that boat, got taken mostly to Asia. Now, here's Indonesia um, taking these diptrocarps again. Um, you know, we're not like this as much. There's some good news here. In the last 10 to 20 years, we've really there's been an international movement to protect native forests. And a lot of it's come from the ground up, from the poor people themselves. This is what I mean about agency. This is what I mean about you having power. So the people with the least power in the world, with no money, no political backing whatsoever, organized and protected their forests in Sarawak. That's incredible. A lot of people have done lots of similar things here in the U.S. Just everyday people have been spokespeople for protecting forests, and by golly, it is working. We are doing way, way better, and that's something quite recent, and it's something that you can do too. But a lot of the people still have to have wood. I don't think cutting a tree down is bad, by the way. Wood, they grow back. Wood is just like really cool stuff. Uh, look, here it is right here. It's holding up this whiteboard. Um, it, it's paper. It's all around us. Um, I, I'm not opposed to cutting down trees, but you've got to do it in a way that's sustainable, that you can allow it to come back. And in a lot of places, people can't think about sustainability because they, they need that wood to heat their food. So they're going out with their llamas here in beginning Ecuador, getting whatever wood they can find just to have energy. And then a lot of forests have been converted for agricultural use. Probably the biggest single vector of forest change and the loss of biodiversity is the expansion of agriculture among the poor. They don't have any choice. And you know what? I totally don't blame them. If I had to feed my kids and there was one, it was like, wow, do I keep those trees or do I cut down this forest to feed my children, I would cut down the forest. I, you know, there's another value orientation I have. Uh, my kids would be more important than the forest to me. Um, and that's what the decisions being made all over the world. Now, for somebody like Burger King to introduce <laughs> Nibu cattle into Costa Rica, where this picture was taken, that's a little bit different story. So there's, based on who owns things and how it's traded, kind of makes a moral difference to me, and maybe makes a moral difference to you. Here's back in Guatemala, a cloud forest that, it was as cool as the forest on the Olympic Peninsula. Big, giant trees with, it kind of looked like you know, Washington, Eastern Oregon, or Southeast Alaska. Just amazing big down logs, epiphytes all over the place. You'd walk, you could walk barefoot. The moss was so thick, it was great. And a couple hundred yards away, this is a picture taken, maybe 200 yards away from this picture, I took this picture. And this is what people are doing to grow food. The farmer is gonna come, plant a little corn here, a little corn there, a little more over there, because they have to. I don't blame them. But look at the loss. So this is, the, this is the guy, you know, with the machete. He's doing it with a match and a machete. And is he bad? <laughs> I don't think this man is bad at all. He's an honorable man. He's working hard. He's got not much. He's raising his family. Um, 
and it's going on everywhere. This is Brazil. Um, you know, fascinating thing about this form of agriculture, about, you know, logging off, burning, growing food, moving on, is that it was used for thousands of years by humanity when the population was lower. Because what would happen is, is you'd do this, you'd circulate around, and about 20 years later, because this is about maybe an acre, half a hectare, uh, you'd come back to the same spot, and 20 years later, this is all grown back. And there's a lot of nutrients back, you do the same thing. And as long as the population density is low enough, it kind of works. It's very kind of conservative system, the nutrients stay right there. But when there's too many people, and too many people clearing, and big logging companies coming, big multinational companies coming and growing sugar beets or nebu cattle or whatever it is, uh, then we've gotten out of control. And that's pretty much what has happened. And what that means to this genetic resource, this biodiversity, this, this kind of storehouse of life on Earth, is that we're losing it really, really fast. If, if I wanted to put those numbers of, uh, you just saw the hectares of the forest conversion that you saw earlier in that table into a term maybe you can understand a little bit easier, it's about an acre a second. About an acre a second of tropical forest is being converted. So that's quite a bit when you think about every, does this lecture's going on, what, 3,600 acres in the hour that I'm speaking will be converted. And most of the world's life is there. Um, you know, 50 to 60 percent of all life on Earth are lo <coughs> is located in tropical forests. Um, we, we know that there's, we're guessing there's around 30 million species. A lot of these are insects, by the way. Um, you know, vertebrates like us are only about one vertebrate is being lost every nine months. And all species, if we include insects like this, maybe 50 a day. So you're thinking, well, whatever, insects, they're kind of small, they bite, I don't like them. Um, mm, you know, that's kind of like maybe they're more important than we think. If we ran into this on Mars, it'd be banner headline, life on Mars. You know, that's a pretty complicated organism right there, probably very specialized, uh, able to survive, you know, in a way that's really quite amazing. The, the other thing that's just so amazing is the more we learn about other life forms, the more we learn how sentient it is. How, you know, we think, oh, that little pea brain thing, that doesn't feel anything. Yeah, animals feel pain. They feel loss. It's remarkable. We just don't understand it yet. So losing life is a big deal. So I'm arguing, from my moral point of view, we don't want to do this. Now, <clears throat> but we tend to want to blame that guy with the machete we saw, uh, who was cutting down those big trees. Um, so these are the proximate reasons, the things that are, we see that are right there, that what's happening. Yes, it's agricultural clearing, cattle grazing, logging, commercial farming, infrastructure development, fuel wood gathering, you saw those people gathering fuel. Those are the proximate causes. That's the agent that's going out there and making the change in the forest and reducing biodiversity. But what's really behind it? What's causing it? Now let's go back to history and remember, ooh, we had this wealth, we have trade, we have all these other things going on. We have population change and growth. We have economic growth. We have this disparity in wealth. We have market failures that we don't understand who owns things and how we value things. We don't value nutrient exchange or oxygen production or, or uh, all those things, and pollination, all the things I was mentioning earlier. And we have horrible policy failures. We subsidize, you know, the extraction of these things. Uh, we as taxpayers pay for it. And then there's corruption. People are, you know, looking the other way. I, I work with uh, park managers. This lecture was also supposed to be about parks. I get a chance to work with national park managers from around the world every summer. They come here to Montana because we have so many different kinds of protected areas. And they're from Madagascar or from Guyana or from Russia or Armenia. It's, um, they are so talented. They're so cool. They're like heroes beyond my imagination. I love them. And they're fun, and they're excited to be in Montana, and we go dancing, it's great. But they're working on really hard problems. So this guy from Zambia was telling me just this last July, he said, what am I going to do? Poaching is just out of control. And here's some, you know, hunter, I won't say what country, 
there's a few countries that really do send in hunters. Um, and they're paying my park guard $1,000 in U.S. cash. $1,000. That's more money than that guy will make in his lifetime if he just looks the other way. Don't say anything. The elephant tusk is going by. You quietly get back in your truck. Go away. Here's $1,000. What are you going to do about that? What are you going to do for that guy? The temptation. I mean, his kid could go to school. It'd be, it'd be just <coughs> unbelievable. Some of them don't take the money and bust the poachers, who are all armed, by the way, and they're putting themselves at risk. Some of them are, have, have that much integrity. I don't know if I would. I don't know if I'd, I'd probably take the money to feed my kids. I probably would. But there are people struggling with this. Corruption is not something that we can just ignore. But to help understand how we deal with this, how do we deal with all those policy failures? Why don't we market these things? I wanted to give you a two-second introduction to property, the idea of ownership, which is relatively new, as I'm mentioning. We have this idea that there's private property, that an individual has dominion over real estate. And they don't. They have rights, but they don't have dominion. Dominion is reserved to an ultimate reversionary interest, usually the state. A place like Africa could be the tribal chief, where there is no state. A place like Somalia, probably the warlord or something like that. There's always some reversionary interest that actually controls the distribution of resources. This is the human reality. And we've organized ourselves into nation states to have that ultimate authority, which I think is really good. And these nation states are accountable to the people through the democratic process and other means. And their purpose is to guard to make sure that private property is protected. So that when I grow my carrots in my backyard, my neighbor, who's bigger than me, can't come over, nice carrots, take them and say, thanks. What the hell? I, I grew these carrots, those are mine. The state will protect me. That's my property. And that's well and good. It gives me assurance that I can put my eco compost on there and work real hard and make sure I water the carrots. And I know my neighbor's not going to take it. Because if he does, I can call the police. Police, agent of the state, comes in. What the hell are you doing taking his carrots? You can't do that. That belongs to him. You know, he has these <laughs> owner rights. But the state is protecting them. That's what we miss. But the state is also insisting that we avoid socially unacceptable uses, that we don't screw it up that I'm not putting plutonium in my soil and poisoning it for the next 50,000 years for everybody. Or that I'm not, in you know, the environmental sense, cutting down these big, giant, last, old-growth trees. The state's going to go, whoa, wait a minute, we have rules about this. Even though that might be on your property, there's an endangered species that lives there. Those are protected by all, for all of us that we've all decided that's socially acceptable to keep that last owl alive and you happen to have the one tree where it is, you can't cut it down. And that is okay. But people don't get the idea of duty and responsibility when we think of property. That's oh, private property. I can do anything I want. No, you can't. The only reason you have private property is because it's sanctioned by the state. That's why you have it. I know that's a nuanced argument. And I want you guys to think about that and learn more about it. Because here's the alternatives. A common property, we're all hippies living on a commune, nobody owns it, okay, but we can exclude the non-hippies, oh, we don't want you, You're, you look weird, you're, you know, somebody we don't like, uh, but we have to constrain these, that's our duty. State properties, like national parks or the Forest Service, we own it as citizens, that's ours, I get to go hike on state land, woohoo, I'm up on Mount Sentinel, this belongs to all of us, this is great, but we have to determine the rules. Talk about arguments. That's the front page of the Missoulian every day. Ugh, Forest Service is doing another timber sale. Whoa, they're doing something terrible. You know, we have to change the rules. Right now, there is going to be a Congress who is going to erode most of the environmental protections on the national forests and drives me crazy because that's who makes the rules. Um, but they have to maintain social objectives. If they go too far, if, you know, Zinke and Danes decide, ah, Glacier National Park, we're selling it off to Vladimir Putin. 
You know, he, he wants to have his new DACA there. It's going to be great. Uh, we'd be ticked. We, they, would, they would probably be booted out of office. So, they, you know, state property has to, we're accountable to citizens, they have to do something. And here's open access. This is the Georgia banks. This is a lot of the world's fisheries. There's nobody who owns it. The only you know, it, right or interest you have is to go get it, capture it. There's no duty. This bad scene, real bad scene. So that's why in modernity, we've kind of created these elements of property. But they are all a construct that we as a society allow. We have the power as a society to be able to constrain property, and more importantly, to be able to create expectations for the owners to behave well. We can insist that the owners protect the soil so we don't lose those environmental services of nutrient cycling and oxygen production and all the things that are important. We have that ability, and it's not wrong. It's always been that way. We just have been kind of in this dream state that someone who has privilege has the ultimate power over property. That's not true. Now, we worry about fires. I'm going to zip through these. We're getting too late. Some cool things. Okay, ha hope in hard times. We're really resilient. The land can come back. Remember that like moonscape I showed you of the land of the trees are all gone? That's trees now. Um, and this is this idea about agency, that I, the one thing I wanted you to learn, that you have power, that you can do something. You know, I, I got to tell you, on Wednesday I was feeling pretty helpless. I was just feeling bad. And, but if you go out and do something, if you participate, that is the secret sauce that keeps you from feeling powerless or helpless or a victim. Get out there. And it doesn't hardly make any difference what it is. It just is this sense of personal accomplishment. This is the way to be able to get out of a box that we are toughly in, in terms of our environment, is to act, is to organize, is to work together. We have enormous power. And then to keep learning. Learning is like this. This is fun. <clears throat> I'm hoping you're learning a little tonight, but uh, I'm sure in the rest of the class you've had really great speakers. You know, this, this land can be forest. It can be this in one lifetime. It's amazing. You know, life is incredibly tough. It comes back. It doesn't give up. It's, 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 I don't, it's almost, it's, well, it is to me miraculous. I can't believe it. You'd think you're totally lost and you're not. Here's a young woman in Malaysia who is uh, reforesting one of those areas that we just saw that dog in. Uh, here's uh, avocados being grown for multi-cropping, where they can grow trees with avocados and row crops uh, underneath them. There's a lot of new, and sometimes you know, copying old uh, agroforestry systems uh, that are allowing us to meet our needs and demands. This is a this is a, uh, a chicle tree uh, um, in southern Mexico, owned by the community. They have understood property rights. There's ejidos. This is a too long of a story. I won't go into it. But communally owned forests there where they get the benefits from this sapote tree. Uh, the, the sap was used for chewing gum base for years before synthetics, but it's still commercially uh, valuable. And they cut down a mahogany tree here to make money, but they reforested mahogany. It's, it's amazing. And these guys are, have their own little community sawmill. And here in Montana, believe it or not, our loggers are really very skilled understanding how to be able to utilize the forest, harvesting in the winter to minimize the impact uh, so the forest can regenerate. Here's some folks, I was in Ecuador, and here's some folks who are managing the Inca Trail, doing it through their community. <laughs> this is happening with people who have very, very limited resources are doing amazing environmental protection. There's a guy from Ghana in that workshop that I talked about, uh, talking with a forester about his park. Here's a, you know, a, a, a teacher who was paid <laughs> nothing and just volunteered in my village uh, in Guatemala. And here's you, finishing your education and making a difference. So remember that one message is that you have power. You have the ability to make change. And don't ever let anyone tell you differently or don't ever think that someone has taken it away because it's always there. 
All right, that's it. So we've got a little while, a couple minutes for questions. Can you recommend a book about the United Fruit Company and the Banana Republic? Yes, Bitter Fruit, Arthur Schlesinger Jr. Uh, is a story of that. This is a really sad story. It's not something that uh, makes you proud of, of our behavior as a nation in 1954, uh, but it goes through their, their whole history. <coughs> I have not bought a Chiquita banana since I left Guatemala in 1976, and I love bananas. Um, there's organic bananas that are produced by, and they're available but the co-op and the good food store and lots of other places, even uh, Orange Street, that aren't, you know, the United Fruit Company's brand. And I'm sure they've changed ownership and God knows are owned by who knows now. Uh, but, you know, just as a matter of principle, I was like, oh, I can't, can't do it. Boycotts, by the way, are very effective social, social actions. Wow. I think I kind of maybe lulled you into, uh, into, uh, into kind of confusion. <laughs> so where, when you were a Peace Corps volunteer in Guatemala, what were the key issues that your village faced? Um, by far, the key issue was land reform, land ownership, this issue of property. The Mayan Indian population, outstanding farmers, uh, had very, very little land even though 99% of them were, you know, the people living in the village, and 1% of them less than that. There were three families that owned all the land, three big coffee plantations. And they had private bodyguards, and they had, uh, they had their own private army. And if you stepped out of line, you got killed. I mean, that's, this is really an extreme. I mean, I lived in an extreme place. Um, that's not like, unfortunately, not that rare, but pretty rare. Um, but the key issue is the issue almost everywhere in developing countries, it's probably true in Thailand, is that people who were good farmers just didn't have access to land. They didn't have either the capital to buy it or they didn't have the legal means to be able to secure the tenure to their land. And so tenure, land tenure reform, as it's called, to try to redistribute land is, of course, one of the underlying causes of many social movements especially in poor countries, to be able to get access to land for people so that they could grow their own food and be independent. Now, re remember, that's us, too. Our back, go back, you know, learning history is really important. Thomas Jefferson talked about the idea of the independent farmer being the basis for a free society, that I can grow my own food, I'm not beholden to anybody else, therefore I'm free thinking, therefore I can elect officials or represent myself based on my independence because I can be productive on my own as a farmer. That was really a core of early American values because most people were farmers. Now, there's still a lot of people who want to grow their own food and they just don't have a legal system to allow it. Here in our country, we unfortunately killed off all the American Indians and so they mostly died of disease as we well know, but there was all this land available that was just eventually distributed for free under the Homestead Act by 1860, but even prior to that, the federal government's job was to dispose of the land to, to individuals, like my ancestors who got this little piece of land in Ohio and, was, you know, tried to make it and did for a while. And that's what was the main issue in Guatemala was that the landed population wanted to be able to grow their own food on areas large enough, and they had a system there where they would allow people to have a little tiny plot, what was called a mini fundio, about a tenth of an acre, and yet all the good land was bananas and coffee, sugar cane, cotton. Those guys were, had cotton bales, remember that picture of those guys <coughs> carrying it? And so they became laborers for much of the year, contract laborers, and paid, you know, dollar a day. Uh, and then they didn't have to be, it was actually worse than slavery. You didn't have to house them, you know, you, they would have to go back to their own little places. Did they achieve land reform? There was a, I left because of political violence, by the way, in 1977. Um, and there was a 20 year civil war. And part of the negotiations for the peace accords, by the way, there's tremendous books on this. There's really fascinating history. Suzanne Jonas is probably the premier historian who's written about the Guatemalan conflict at the last part of the 20th century. 
Um, they tried to have land reform in the new constitution and it was voted down by an eyelash by the general population of Guatemala. Guatemala City voted entirely against it. It was really close. So the, they did get rid of, they did get rid of lots of the violence. You saw that soldier walking through that village uh, and they had civilian patrols and they had really, really terrible extra paramilitary forces, uh, a la Somalia and other countries that we read about now. Uh, and those were eliminated. Uh, the violence level in the rural areas has, has really dropped. Now they're common crime, unfortunately, in Guatemala and in places like Tegucigalpa and, you know, all these other really, you know, San Salvador, beautiful places, just great places. It's just really out of control. A lot of that's fueled by drug money. Um, but it's a very, very complicated environment there. But the basic structure hasn't changed all that much. Um, the other fascinating thing, if you want to really read about the most amazing land reform in North American history, read about the Mexican Revolution in 1910. Uh, read about the ejido system. Where some of them still stay. Where that, I showed you that picture of those, that forest ejido where they communally own their property. It's hard to do it, though. You have to have the institutions to sustain, the social institutions to sustain and enforce that protection. You actually need a strong government to be able to sustain the protection of property, whether it's communal property or state property or private property. And we, we, we just miss that part. So what do you guys think is one of the things you want to do? What are you, what are you going to do to make the environment better? I talked about a lot of trouble here, deforestation and biodiversity. I don't want you going out, oh, help. Uh, what, what, what can you do? Any, any ideas? Yes? I mean, there's the um, divestment movement right oh, now great. going on at the university. Yeah, yeah. A lot of students are encouraged, trying to encourage um, the UN Foundation to divest from fossil fuels. Um, I've been working with that. I mean, good for you. It's a it's a hard fight because uh, the biggest donor to the university like owns the railroad, so it's a it, it's going to take a lot to try and get it to happen. But you know, that's why that's why we're fighting. So that's something. That's something very important. More power to you more power to you. I think that's significant. Uh, Denny Washington, who's the biggest donor to the university that you mentioned, and by the way, he's not the biggest donor. The biggest donor is a guy named Bill Franke, who just gave a $24 million gift to the College of Forestry and Conservation. He's going to be here on campus this weekend. Um, and the regents are going to, you know, celebrate that as well as the president of the university, which is wonderful. Um, and he's an airline guy, by the way. But the Washingtons have given money to the university, and he does own Montana Rail Link, which makes money by moving coal from eastern Montana to ports in, well, one port now, in western Washington to move to China. Well, th nobody wants to buy coal anymore because A, it's really dirty, B, obviously global warming, but C, there's alternatives that are better and cheaper. So the Chinese don't even want it. Um, the only people who want it are people who are living somewhere in 1952 that think this is a great fuel. It's not. Uh, Arch Coal is bankrupt. Peabody Coal is bankrupt. <laughs> yes. They're, they, if I had a picture of the Peabody Coal people, I would have showed you a picture of them. That's where my family comes from. They're, they're from southeast Ohio and West Virginia, eastern Kentucky. I couldn't be happier. Peabody went down. <laughs> now, values again, okay. Sorry if some scion of the Peabody Coal Company is in the room. I'm not trying to be insulting to you, but they did a <laughs> lot of awful stuff in that, in that Appalachian, central Appalachian. What is that money going to go to in the College of Forestry? Yeah. It's going to go to six different things. Um, it's going to go to a Sustainability Fellows Program where you, as a student, can go overseas and have a stipend to work for somewhere between uh, six weeks and three months uh, on a project in Zambia, Bhutan, Vietnam, Chile, uh, there's one more country, and um, it's unbelievably great. 
It's going to go to two endowed professorships. Bill is really, Bill Frankie is very interested in water quality. There's a place up in Big Fork. He's from Phoenix. He doesn't have that many connections to Montana, although he worked as a young man on the High Line for a timber company. And uh, so he's going to be one new forestry endowed professor, one for water uh, quality, uh, graduate student support in wildlife biology. Uh, you know, it's kind of a diverse gift. Bill helped, you know, generate that and work with me and others to be able to uh, build the gift. And it'll be given over about a uh, ten-year period, maybe five. I can't remember what the, I, you know, since I wasn't involved in the final negotiations, I'm not exactly sure how it's <laughs> distributed from, I'll find out on Friday because I'm going to see Bill and his wife Carol and his son Dave on Friday and, you know, thank him for doing something really great. Um, but you've, 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 I'm really proud of you for being in this divestment thing because uh, taking money infers an obligation, infers an obligation to certain kinds of values. And sometimes money's too expensive. Sometimes I'm not taking money from a guy who makes grenades. I'm not. I'm sorry. That money is blood money. I'm just not taking it. We'll find money somewhere else. I'm taking the money from the coal companies, I'm going to do that. And you have to have courage to do that because you, you need money. But that's again, this is this, this is this values thing that I want you to reflect on your own. What's important to you? Um, and uh, and having, <laughs> you know, I've been around long enough to know integrity is all you got. In the end, that's all you have is what you believe in and, and adhering to what you believe in. That's what allows you to sleep at night you know, look yourself in the mirror and be proud of yourself as if you stood up for your values. And sometimes that's hard. Actually, I, I heard a lecture once from the president of Dartmouth University, a really wonderful man. And he said, <coughs> you know, uh, determining what's right and wrong usually isn't that hard. It's usually fairly clear what's right and what's wrong. What's hard is doing what's right. You know what's right but it's really hard to do it. But you have to. And I thought that was really great advice. So, but you can look at these people with nothing. I just showed you <coughs> pictures of them who are organizing around protecting the Inca Trail or, or, or protecting the forests in Mexico or teaching kids or doing things, and they have nothing. <laughs> I mean, they make $200 a year, and they're, and they're making a difference. It's amazing. It's amazing. And that can be, that can be you. Teresa said uh, 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 that, that, you know, the Peace Corps is something that we both experienced. And I learned a lot through that. I learned a lot of respect for people's abilities and their resilience and their humor and their ability to and to have joy in a situation where I was friggin' miserable, freezing cold and covered with flea bites and, you know, uh, hungry. Not as hungry as them, but there wasn't very much food. And, you know, you'd think I'd be totally miserable. If I was thrown in that situation right now, I'd be like, ah, it's terrible. And at the time, I'm like, yah ha ha going to a birthday party, having a great time. Uh, you can have that. You adjust. You realize, wow, I can do this. I bet I'm telling you something that you would agree with, is that I was sad. You know, for the first 12 months I was there, I was like, damn, this is hard. I have no electricity. Uh, there's no hot water. Uh, I had to shave cold. I had to shave my shave back then because Guatemalan men didn't have beards. And, uh, terrible. And then by the t end, I didn't want to leave. I was totally, I was totally adjusted. I'm like, this is fine. I'm not, oh, I have one cheek on the seat in the bus. <laughs> you know, I'm comfortable. Uh, it's amazing how, how you can adapt. But we don't want people to adapt too much to the new administration. <laughs> no, no, we have to know what's wrong. Uh, I don't really have anything more. Thank you for your patience and time. Remember, you can make a difference. Don't ever forget that. And thanks for being such a nice audience.